right on Inside Story. Oh my god, I'm gone. There's a killer on the loose. One victim's dead. Please don't tell me this is her. Another's been wounded. He said, let you live. Wait till you see what's coming next. He's on fire and running for his life. I honestly believe that I was going to die right there. What happens when rejection turns to rage? He just snapped. And bitter, violent men take their deadly revenge. This is a person I considered my brother. It was just something that a human can't do to another human. I'm Layla McKinnon. Welcome to Inside Story. They say revenge is a dish best served cold, and the two killers you'll meet tonight are as cold and calculating as they come. Possessive, domineering men, full of rage and hell-bent on vengeance. And their victims, the women they allegedly loved. Two women who dared to say no. Alicia Loxley's been looking at how that rejection led to murder. Well, Layla, it really is quite chilling to see how these two men went about exacting their revenge. And their victims were such beautiful women, so loving, trusting and vivacious. And yet they made the fatal mistake of falling for men who at first seemed very charming. But as you'll see, all the while, they were monsters. Yes, Alicia, as we'll see, they were indeed monsters. Two women who dared to say no pay the ultimate price. In my wildest dreams, oh, I just didn't think she was dead. All in the name of revenge. As I turned, I realised that she was dying. There's an old saying, beware the fury of a patient man. And it couldn't be more relevant today, especially in the cases of two vengeful killers you'll encounter tonight. This is a story of rejection, simmering rage, and deadly revenge. Lisa Keane made two fatal mistakes. One was to fall in love with the wrong man. The second was to reject him. I said to her, you want to be careful. This man's pretty bad. But years of public brawls and private terror could not prepare her for what would finally come. And I just couldn't believe that someone that loved her so much could do something like that to her. Richard Giordana had plotted for months, and then on June the 14th, 2008, his simmering rage finally boiled over. He struck, and what followed left police astounded. It's one that I never forget. As we will see later, from the very beginning, there were warning signs. He met her the night he came back to Australia um, after being in jail. When did you get a sense that Richard might not be what he was claiming to be? I always knew that Richard had an anger problem. But Lisa was prepared to overlook the ominous signs because in Richard Giordana, she felt she had finally met her soulmate. What did Lisa say about his angry side? Well, she was scared of him. Why do you think she was staying with him? She, right. she seemed to be aware. Well, she was in love with him. I know she loved him. In our other case tonight, Claire Carey also thought she met the man of her dreams. But there was one big problem. She discovered Mick Staines was married. And when she tried to move on, all hell broke loose. The enraged Mick Staines bursts into her bedroom and shoots her dead as she God pleads for her life. And I turned towards Claire. What the hell is going on here? Beside her is a man she has just met. It's their first date. And Paul Gray is about to cop it too. I honestly believe that I was going to die right there. How lucky was Paul that that the bullet hit where it did? Had the bullet not lodged in his temple and, and entered his skull, obviously the injuries would have been fatal at that time. Paul may have dodged a fatal bullet, but now he faces a very determined killer. And I said, look, mate, for God's sake, let me live. I've got kids. And his response was, let you live. Wait till you see what's coming next. As we will see, Mick Staines is in no mood for mercy. He's just getting started. You never really know someone, do you? Ah.
But first, Harvey Bay, Queensland, 2008. Lisa Keem's marriage was over. She hoped she had finally broken free of her violent, controlling partner, Richard Giordana. But as we will see in this extraordinary real-life footage, he had been planning his revenge for months. She said, I, I have a feeling he's watching me. She said, I always look over my shoulder or at night, um, look out the window and think he's out there. And she was quite frightened. Yeah. Harvey Bay was meant to be a new start for both Lisa and Richard. They'd moved north from Sydney to repair their troubled relationship. I was really worried about her going up there because it meant that she was isolated, she had no family. And I didn't know how he was treating her. And within weeks, it was obvious Richard was back to old ways, captured here in a vicious brawl in a local pub. He didn't have a job, he was drinking and taking drugs and Lisa started thinking and saying to me, I, I want children, what will happen if I had children to this man? I said to her, I don't think that you can build a house on crack foundations. And I said, I've got to tell you this. And I said, once a drug addict, always a drug addict. And I don't think he's going to change. And she hung up on me. Finally, Lisa had had enough. She threw Richard out but he stalked her for weeks. So you knew she was in danger? I knew she was in danger. He was coming backwards and forwards and ringing her and abusing her and, you know, saying, you know, I want to come back. And I was like, oh, please don't take him back. Finally, Richard reluctantly agreed to move back to Sydney. However, as we will discover, there was no way that he was ever going to let Lisa get away alive. It was premeditated as well, wasn't it? From all the police reports, yes. He was obsessed with her and he, he couldn't live without her. And, and he said that to her, I can't live without you. For months he planned his revenge and then he struck. I believe that she fought for every breath. <coughs> it was disgusting what he did to her. It was just something that a human can't do to another human. I felt like a bomb had hit me. I just, I kept thinking, us girls, we're untouchable. Who, who could hurt us? But Richard Giordana made one simple mistake, one that would eventually bring him undone. That's the last mistake. It's a shopping and finishing with Adams for exceeding the speed. All the way in the centre of the ticket. We believed uh, he was definitely our guy. He can run all he likes and hide all he likes, but, you know, we are always going to get him. Coming up on the Inside Story, the warning signs. She was scared of him. I knew she was. I was just really, really worried. The angry beast inside Richard Giardino. He just snapped. Lisa Keem and Richard Giordana seemed made for each other. Dynamic, charismatic, both lived life to the full. But just one year after they finally married, Lisa Keem was dead, murdered by her estranged husband. God, you're beautiful, Lisa. <laughs> Especially when you've got the camera covering your face. Tell me how you describe Lisa. She was a beautiful soul. She was just gentle. She was um, strong-willed. She could tell a um, fantastic story even at a, at a young age. She was well-liked. All her girlfriends always hung around our house. They um, would all come home and we'd have the radio on and listen to the Top 40 and we'd be dancing and laughing. <laughs> Staying alive. <laughs> Just getting on really well. It was great. She had lots of friends going through primary and then went off to high school with all the same friends and made new friends. Was never nervous about talking in front of people and she was outspoken. Lovely legs. <laughs> she was just a, a free soul. Yeah, I miss her. <laughs> Lisa was 23 when she met Richard. She had a high-flying job at a Sydney law firm and two degrees. 
Giordana was a mechanic with a past. He'd just got out of prison for drug smuggling. What did she say to you about meeting Richard? What do you remember about that night? He told her a lot about himself, how he grew up, how he was in jail. He met her the night he came back to Australia um, after being in jail. But Lisa, whose first marriage had failed, was bowled over by Richard's sheer charisma. What did you think of him? What were your impressions of him when you met him? Did um, you like him? I did, yeah. I th he, obviously, he made Lisa very happy. She had met her equal. She had met someone just as outrageous as her, someone that could handle her and, and handle that she, you know, that she was outgoing and outspoken. But it was not long before Richard's dark, controlling side emerged. Lisa told me once that he tried to, grabbed Lisa around the throat and tried to strangle her and she said that his eyes glazed over and she had to say, Richard, it's me, it's Lisa, it's me, it's Lisa. And she goes, he just snapped. She was scared of him, I knew she was. She did some, at one stage, say he threw the telly through the window. I was just really, really worried. Lisa was worried too, but she wanted the relationship to work, so she suggested a move to Harvey Bay, where they could start over. I said to her, well, look, everyone's entitled to a second chance as long as he's not taking drugs now, and he's looking after you, and she said, yes, he was. And for a while it worked. They rented a large house right on the beach, and Lisa started a dog grooming business. But Richard struggled to find work, and the cycle of violence and remorse began all over again. He would often just go to the pub and drink and take drugs, um, and that's when things were always bad. Just how bad can be seen in this security footage, captured at the local pub. Lisa and Richard were drinking with friends when something set him off. Richard calmly walks around the table and attacks one of the group. Throughout it all, Lisa just sat there. She had seen it many times before. Why do you think she was staying with him? She, right. she seemed to be aware. Well, she was in love with him. I know she loved him. And so powerful was that love, Lisa decided to marry Richard, no matter what. I didn't want her to marry him. I can tell you that now. She wanted me to give her away and I said, no, <laughs> I couldn't do it. I just didn't want to do it. I said, I'll just be there for you. Looking back on it, it was probably one of the most unhappy days of her life. Driving to the ceremony, she wasn't smiling. She was very nervous. We had to stop the car and she couldn't get out of the car. Um, and I just thought that was nerves. Um, I asked her if she was all right and she, looking back at it, I think she was thinking, am I doing the right thing? By now, Lisa was trapped and the more she knew about Richard, the more she wanted out. Lisa started thinking and saying to me, I, I want children. What will happen if I had children to this man? That must have been so hard for you. I just thought Lisa's a very strong person. If she doesn't want something in her life, she'll tell him. And she did, she, she walked away and she said, I still loved him, I love him. And she probably still loved him when she died, but she couldn't be with him. She couldn't be with that person. Richard didn't take the breakup well. And he was really angry. And that was before he packed up and went home. And he came to the shop, I think once, and abused her and said, I'm going to do it my way now. And she was like, she was petrified. By January 2008, Richard had finally accepted the marriage was finished. He moved back to Sydney. Finally free of Richard Giordana, Lisa Keem could move on. So he moved back yeah. and she was up there in Harvey Bay. She was up there, she started to get a life together. She started to meet friends because she didn't have really any friends. Really, she was getting fit. She looked fantastic, actually. I was so proud of her. I really was that she'd done this and I was hoping that he'd just stay away. But Richard Giordana had no intention of staying away. He had always planned to come back to get his revenge. And that revenge would be carefully planned. 
Giordana bought a nondescript car in a false name to sneak back to Harvey Bay from Sydney, some 1,200 kilometres. He cunningly set out to avoid the CCTV cameras that would catch him at service stations. And we received information from, from work colleagues that, in fact, he'd um, sourced uh, fuel cans, uh, fuel containers, uh, planning, planning a big trip. After going to all that trouble to avoid detection on his way north, Richard Giordano made a careless mistake that would be part of his undoing later. He was pulled over for speeding just outside Bulladilla here on the New South Wales mid-north coast and he gave the officer his real name. This was that very moment. You got your license? When did you buy the car? Oh, about two days ago. Um, I've got the retro papers here. OK, if you wouldn't mind. Go and blow the wind whistle. Yeah. That's your licence, bud. It's a shocking infringement notice for exceeding the speed. All yeah. explain the centre of the ticket, pay within a period of 21 days. There's facilities on the reader to do it if you want. OK? No but as he drove away with that fine, police couldn't have known what evil he planned at the end of his journey. A journey that would end at Lisa's house in Harvey Bay, Queensland. You wouldn't have thought that in broad daylight and on such a busy road that you could get away with murder. But on that Saturday afternoon, Lisa shut up shop at her dog grooming business at 2. She did a bit of shopping and then was back home here by 3.30. She parked her car in the usual spot, waved hello to one of her neighbours and went inside. But what Lisa didn't realise was that Richard was waiting for her, out of sight, in that backyard garage. And when he was ready to strike, he broke in. Lisa didn't stand a chance. I believe that she fought for every breath. It was disgusting what he did to her. It was just something that a human can't do to another human and then throw her in the bush like a dirty old rag like that she was nothing. Coming up. Why? Why her? Police turn up the heat on their number one suspect. Richard Giardina, he, he was our only suspect. I've spoken to her for months, mate, you know? Why are you ringing me? <laughs> Richard Giardina has brutally murdered his estranged wife, Lisa King strangling her in the house they once shared together. Richard Giordana drove for nearly 10 hours with his wife's body hidden in his vehicle before he dumped her. He chose this remote location, the Mariah River State Forest near Kempsey on the mid-north coast. According to Lisa's mum, Rosie, it's a place that he knew well. And this is where he discarded the woman he once loved, doused her body in petrol and set her alight. Just hours later, Lisa's body was discovered by a bushwalker and the New South Wales police were called in. Did you know that it was a woman very early on? Not, not initially, no. No, not until uh, certainly the autopsy had taken place. And the signs that she had been murdered were pretty clear, were they? Uh, it was quite uh, obvious uh, that she had been killed and met foul play and that we had to try and identify who she was. Meanwhile, in Harvey Bay, Lisa's family and friends reported her missing. They turned to Facebook and her family began making frantic phone calls. The first was to Lisa's ex, Richard Giordana. I actually rang him and I said to him, are you aware that Lisa's gone missing? And he said, uh, are you aware that I haven't spoken to Lisa in about six months? And I knew then that he had something to do with it because he didn't answer my question. What was he like on the phone? I just knew that he was lying. I knew it. And I knew he had her. That's what I kept thinking, he's got her. Now Queensland police turned Lisa's house into a crime scene, and they too 
begin to suspect her husband. What did officers find at the house? Although the place was very neat and tidy, a trained eye was able to uh, recognise signs of a, of a struggle and we knew that uh, perhaps this was uh, more than just a missing person. Uh, a close inspection of this front office found uh, a, a blind had been knocked down, that a earring, an ear stud, uh, was located on the floor. Down south in New South Wales, where Lisa's body was found, the crime scene was also beginning to yield vital clues. A diamond ear stud and telltale tyre tracks. Along with dental records, both police forces now knew that this was Lisa Keane. And they had a pretty fair idea who might be responsible. He was our primary focus um, once we had identified uh, who Lisa was and certainly started looking at him more closely. Richard Giardina, he, he was our only suspect, our only person of interest. Queensland Police turned up the heat on Giordana. In this actual phone call, they press him on when he last saw Lisa. Hello? Hello, is that Richard? Yeah. Yeah, Richard Ian Armbrust here from the Harvey Bay CIB. How are you going? Yeah, good, mate. Look, um... Someone rang you last night, I was a bit of Lisa, so... I was straight through the months, mate, you know? Well, why are you ringing me? But this is a blatant lie, and they know it because they have found fresh fingerprints at the crime scene. Giordana's prints, and they soon uncover more damning evidence. We spoke to a, a number of work colleagues who mentioned that he returned to work on the Monday and had scratches down the, uh, the right side of his face. We knew that, uh, it, that he was responsible. And then there was the police footage of Giordana filmed the day before Lisa was murdered. Giordana was pulled over for speeding while driving north to Queensland. But carelessly, he gave the officer his real name. That's license, bud. It's a shopping and finishing with notice for exceeding the speed. All yeah. explain the center of the ticket. Payment for a period of 21 days. There's facilities on the reader to do it if you want. Okay? No but before police could question him in person, Giordana was gone. He fled to Italy to hide out with relatives. Rosie is now given the news she will never forget. As I pulled into the driveway and put the car away in the garage. Two gentlemen started walking towards me and I thought they were the media. <laughs> I thought, oh no. And they, when they got close, they showed me their badge. And, and I just looked at them and I sat on the floor. I said, please don't tell me this is her. And they said, well, we're like 99% sure that it's her, we're waiting for DNA. And I just, for some reason, I just had to lie down. And I lied down on the floor and I kept looking at him saying, not my girl. Please don't let this be my girl. Why? Why her? And I don't, uh, it was just so hard. It was just very, very difficult at that stage. And I felt like a bomb had hit me. And mum pulled me aside and told me that they'd found Lisa. And I just cried and cried and cried. And a part of me just left me. We will remember our friend forever, but now it's time to say goodbye. We will let you go and be at peace. While her family grieved... She was a beautiful yeah, daughter and a beautiful be human a being, and it was just such a tragic loss. Richard was hiding in Italy, and bizarrely, and in a complete shock, just four weeks later, Richard Giordana handed himself in at the Australian Embassy in Madrid. Could you believe, not so much your luck in a sense, but he essentially came back of his own free will? Mm, yes, it was, like I said, very, very surprising, uh, but we believe he was you know, a broken man, you know, financially and, um, and emotionally. Uh, and that's why, why he's returned home. Back in Australia, Giordana refused police interviews. And for two years, as the case made its way through the courts, he maintained his innocence, right up until day one of the trial. We went into the courtroom and he walked in and it was so hard to look at him. This is a person I considered my brother. Did he look at you? Yes, he did look at us. And how hard was that? 
very hard. It was hard. It's hard to look him in the face. Um, you know, it was hard not to cry um, because there was so many emotions going through me. What was that look like from him? It was a sad look. And then the bombshell. Richard Giordana would plead guilty after all. So what was that moment like for you? Relief. That ain't come any, any bigger than, than a murder. And the fact that uh, we'd investigated it, uh, we'd found our guy, we'd charged our guy, and we'd now successfully prosecuted that guy. The sentence, life in prison. The people say to you, they say, you've got to forgive to move on. But how can you forgive when someone's done something so disgusting? Even if he got the death penalty, it's still, that's not good enough. Because her life stopped that moment. What about now? How do you feel about that? Um, I still want to know the truth. I don't understand how he could just burn someone that he loves so much. I never got to hug her goodbye or say goodbye to her. So it's hard for me not knowing what happened. Still to come on Inside Story. What the? A relentless killer. One victim down, another shot in the head. I saw the sparks come out of the end of the gun. Then this. Wait to see what's coming next. Gray is a very lucky man. He and his new girlfriend were on their first date, getting along just fine. Suddenly, a demented gunman with revenge on his mind burst through the door. What happened next is truly remarkable. Paul Gray thought it was an intimate night in with his new girlfriend, Claire Carey. But before the night was out, Claire would be murdered by her crazed ex-lover, Mick Staines and Paul Gray was left fighting for his own life. I honestly believed that I was going to die right there. I was losing consciousness and the last thoughts that I had were, it's been a great life. And then fade to blank from me. Townsville in North Queensland, it oozes peace and tranquility and the locals choose to live a laid back lifestyle. But even the most beautiful places have a dark side. And on a balmy Saturday night in 2006, Mick Stain's carefully planned revenge sent a shudder of horror and disbelief through the entire community. Something that we haven't seen since and, and hope not to see again. Mick Stain's victim, 44-year-old Claire Carey, was a free spirit with a strong social conscience. Had you ever met anyone like Claire before? No, she's one of a kind. I think they broke the mould when Claire was around. She was an activist from Warred Go, I think. Captivated by the Great Barrier Reef and passionate about protecting it, she signed up as a volunteer with the Greens. She devoted herself to other causes too, including, ironically, stopping violence against women. She wanted to look after those less fortunate, and even when it came to animals, didn't she? Oh, yes. Claire had a dog with one eye <laughs> and a bird with one wing. She liked to fight the good fight. She had a care for people who couldn't care for themselves. She just wanted the world to be a better place. When she met Michael Patrick Staines, she thought he was a perfect fit. And certainly, Mick seemed smitten too. What do you think Claire was attracted to in Mick? You know, she just wanted to be a normal person, have a normal life, have someone to come home to that loves you and you love them. But as you'll see, there was a side to Mick Staines no one saw. On meeting him, did you think there was any reason that Claire should be concerned about him or feel unsafe? No. I, I actually didn't even see this one coming. You would never have seen it coming. If Mick was head over heels, the gloss soon wore off for Claire. Despite talk of marriage and moving in together, after an intense couple of months, 
Claire found out that Mick Staines was already married and put an end to the relationship. It proved to be a fatal decision. I'd say eight weeks in total that they were seeing each other. But when she found out that not only was he still married, but he was still living at home, that was the end of it for her. And that was it. Mick's act of deadly revenge came a few weeks after the breakup, when Claire met Paul Gray, a lawyer who worked in the same building. And there was an attraction there from the start? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I certainly thought she was nice. What did you like about her? What was she like? What I liked about her was that she had a friendly smile on her face and in her eyes. You could see the chemistry happening there. Uh, when every time Paul went past the door, you know, he'd look in, see what she was doing could see you liked her. So that's, that's the start of anything, isn't it? It was the spark between them that lit a deadly fuse in Mick Staines. A few days before their first date, Mick Staines dropped into Claire's office to say hi, and she introduced him to Paul, who put out his hand and said, pleased to meet you, Mick. Those words would come back to haunt Paul in the worst way possible. Did you have any inkling as to who he was or...? I had no idea. She said, Paul, this is Mick. <laughs> and that was all the explanation that I got. But soon, Paul would get to know all about Mick Staines. The very next day, Paul took Claire to the basketball. And as they sat and watched the game, little did they know that Mick Staines was watching them. Did you get a sense that night at all that you were being watched while you were out with Claire? No. Never occurred to me. They stopped for a drink at the casino and when they drove off, Mick was right behind them. On the way home, we had a discussion about your place or mine for a, for a drink afterwards. Mm -hmm. Have you gone over that conversation in your mind a few times? Yeah, that was a bad decision, as it turned out. Back at Claire's house, the mood mellowed. And one thing led to another, and we, before long, we were naked in bed and mm -hmm. yeah, doing what people do. Two new lovers oblivious to the horror that was about to unfold. And listening downstairs, Mick Staines. I'm, I have been over this a million times in my own mind, uh, how that would have been. You probably would have uh, heard that they were, you know, sort of more than friends. Just after 1.30 a.m. on November 19, 2006, Mick Staines quietly lets himself into Claire's Aitkenvale home with a key she had given him. He's armed with a 22 rifle. What happens next is as chilling as it is calculating. Well, the first I knew of it was uh, I heard a crack noise. And then I heard an angry voice in the room. As I went to come up from under the covers, they were pulled back from me. And I was staring straight down at the, the barrel of the gun. What sort of state was he in when he came Pure in? anger, rage. He was really angry. What the? How the f did you do this to me? You f Don't do this. Shut the f up! At first, Claire thinks she can calm Mick down. I, I was blown away by her reaction. I remember even at the time because she said... For God's sake, Mick! This is ridiculous! The seriousness of the whole thing just kept sort of becoming more and more apparent in stages. For God's sake, Mick! Him being there was bad enough and then him having a gun was another thing. What were you thinking? Oh, my God. This is as serious as it gets. Mick Staines shoots her two times. She had a wound in a the, in the chest that was sort of bubbling out about an inch or two high and she looked quite serene. She was but all covered in blood. The hair was all spread out over the pillows. and So I knew that she was in big trouble. Paul's in big trouble too. 
Mick Staines menacingly repeats the words spoken just the day before. He said, please to meet you, Mick, and pull the trigger. And I, I saw the sparks come out of the end of the gun. I was losing consciousness and the last thoughts that I had were, it's been a great life. And then fade to black from there. Paul Gray, on the run, still in the firing line. Picked up the gun again and started firing pot shots at me. I'm like, oh, no. What the? What the? In a terrifying rampage of revenge, Mick Staines has shot his ex-girlfriend, Claire Carey, dead. Then he's turned the gun on her new boyfriend, Paul Gray. Miraculously, the bullet didn't penetrate his skull. But Paul wasn't off Mick's hook. You knew that he wasn't done with you yet either? Well, apparently not. He'd said that, you know, wait till you see what's coming next, and I didn't know whether that meant a bigger gun or he was going to drag a cannon into the room or what it was, because I thought, well, what more can you do? And that's when he came back with the petrol and uh, started throwing that all over us. He's then gone um, back out into the main area where he set a lot of pillow, and that pillow has been thrown through the bedroom door. And as it hit the floor, it just went And everything was on fire. And then I heard the front door slam, but by now, all the lounge area was on fire too. I remember actually sliding down the door thinking, that's it, I'm gone means of escape, a window in the spare bedroom. But he's about to face an impossible choice. I was about to sort of shimmy out and lower myself down the out of the window and I heard this voice say, Come on, you bastard! I'm waiting for you! And I looked down and there was this Mick character again pointing the gun at me. So your option was to jump out of the window and be shot by Mick or stay inside and burn to death? Yeah. It was at that moment Paul's survival instinct kicked in. Something deep within and just said, I'm going to get out of this place, come hell or high water. I'm not going to die here. And I don't think you could have killed me with a bazooka at that point. <laughs> I was just so determined to get out of there uh, because I wanted, this, wanted people to know what had happened and I did not want him to get away with this. Then Paul saw an opportunity to escape and grabbed it. When I couldn't see him, I figured he was at the front door and coming through the front door. So I thought, well, it's now or never, and went out the window. How big a drop was that for Paul? It would be a drop in the order of about seven metres. So he'd been shot, his body was alight, and he managed to jump seven metres? Yes. As I hit the ground and, and looked up, there he was in his car, having just backed out of the driveway. No. So the minute he saw me, he picked up the gun again and started firing pot shots at me, and I just legged it up the road as the best I could. Detective Jack Miles can't recall a more incredible tale of survival. How lucky do you think he is to have survived? To survive the, the initial gunshot, very lucky. To make good his escape on the second occasion, extremely lucky and then to ward off further attacks by Mick after that have made him a very fortunate man, I believe. Police arrived at the scene, called to what they initially thought was a house fire. What they discovered was a body, a burned man alive with a bullet in his head and a killer on the loose. Uh, very quickly we were able to establish his linkages to Claire through their previous relationship and we set about trying to locate him at that point in time. After killing Claire and leaving Paul for dead, Mick came here to his rented workshop. Armed with a bag full of weapons, his murderous rampage wasn't over. Incredibly, he was ready to take on the police. If police had gone in, it could have been a tragedy. Certainly, if police had, if police had gone in there unprepared and, uh, and uh, unsure of what actually was going on, then yes, I'm, I'm certain it would have been a tragedy for me. It was now 1.30 in the morning, and while he waited, 
guns loaded, Mick Staines called his wife Charlie. By the time I got through the phone, it had gone to message bank and he had said, you know, that he had, he, he had done something, that he was very sorry for all the things that he had put me through. So as I said, at that, at that point, I knew that there was something really wrong, something had gone it unbelievably wrong. By now, Mick Staines could see no way out. He shot himself, yeah. Coming up... At one stage I had 1,800 staples in my leg. Recovering from the nightmare. Pretty much got shot every night. So, a good six months or so. In November 2006, an enraged Mick Staines burst in on his ex-girlfriend Claire Carey and her new lover, Paul Gray, with one thing on his mind, revenge. This is ridiculous. You can pay for this. He shot Claire dead and tried to kill Paul too, before finally taking his own life. Eight years on, Paul Gray still carries the scars. How, how are you feeling now? Well, pretty good overall, generally. Uh, still have my moments here and there. What about the physical scars as well? They're obviously... Yeah, they're certainly there. I mean, you can see from my legs there, but they did, you can only sort of say, well, they did fantastic work considering there was no skin there at all, so... Is that the leg that you almost lost? Yeah, they were going to take it off about here. Paul endured seven skin graft operations. At one stage I had 1,800 staples in my leg. And then there is the scarring of the mind. Every day, Paul is reminded of the night Mick Staines boiled over. Pretty much got shot every night. For a good six months or so. When you think back to that night, what you went through, the injuries you sustained, and yet you came out of it and survived, and now here to tell the story. Can you believe it? Well, I guess so, because I am here. <laughs> it, it took a lot of work, and there was a great deal of determination that I was not going to be a victim. I'd, I'd made an early decision not to be a victim about it. Um, yeah. Do you think about her and, and what might have been? Yeah, I mean, really, the, the day was all the way through it, thinking, where have you been all my life? <laughs> Why was I wasting my time up until right now? And yeah, I would have loved to have seen where it went. I will miss her. The, I don't think there will be anybody quite like Claire ever again in my life. There will be other people, but not quite like that. Claire Carey's murder was a tragedy that ended with Mick Staines taking his own life. Like Claire Carey, Lisa Keem also said no, and it cost her her life, killed by a vengeful husband. Her brutal murder has left a gaping hole at the centre of her family. What do you miss most about Lisa? I miss having that closeness. I miss my best friend. I miss being able to hang out with her on a Saturday night with a bottle of champagne in our pyjamas. <laughs> I miss going to the supermarket in our pyjamas and shopping at midnight. All the things we used to do together. Does it give you some comfort that he is now in jail? No. The only comfort is that he can't hurt anyone else. This is a person I considered my brother for a very long time and someone that had loved my sister unconditionally but yet he'd done something so horrible to her. But Lisa did leave a legacy, her dog grooming business, Foxy Furs. Moses was the actual inspiration for the Foxy Furs sign and symbol. He's um, one of Lisa's dogs. She had him from the time he was born, so we've inherited him. Rosie has also inherited Lisa's dream, and she has a plan. I would like to have Foxy furs in lots of places, 
so that um, when Richard Giordano comes out of jail, there's not many places he's going to be able to go without seeing a reminder of Lisa.